9 through 34. This is the word of God. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Thus says the Lord. This is your first time worshiping with us. I'd love to meet you afterwards. Um, my wife and I, uh, Tatiana, that just did the scripture reading, would love to meet with you. So please come up to, to me and talk to us and, and ask us any questions about the church or just get to know us in general. If you know, it has nothing to do with the church, we, we would like that too because um, we'd love to get to know you. Just one thing before I start with the sermon, reiterate again what, what Chipta said in the announcements. We are going to have our next membership class um, uh, uh, on next week, the week after, and the week after. For the next three weeks, we're going to have our membership classes. What is a membership class? It's just letting you know um, who CCC is and what Covenant City Church is wanting to do and what our heart is, what our doctrines are, who our leadership team is, all these details about, about us. Um, if you want to know more about that, please come and join us. It's going to be here after church. Lunch is going to be provided. Um, it's going to be from about 1220 to, I don't know, 145, something like that. Okay, we'll try to make it as quick as possible. Um, it does not mean that you are admitted into membership. It does not mean that if you sign up, you're, you're, you're going to be you're committed into membership. You're not. It just means that you're interested to know more about that. Um, so if you want to know more about it and you want to join it, please put your name here and whatever detail, details you want to give us so we can email you and contact you uh, more about that later. All right, let's jump into our sermon. We're continuing in our series in the book of John. If you've been with us before, you know we just got done with the series in the book of Galatians, and now we're uh, jumping into John. Uh, uh, we've already done four sermons on John, uh, but it is a bigger book, so we want to try and get it done as, as, as faithfully, but also, if we can, not pr prolong it any more than we need to. Um, so next week, we've, we've gone through four, but next week we're going to do another passage, okay? But, but this is the last week we're going to do John um, in this, in this four-week stretch. So the book of John is a book in the New Testament. It's a what is called a gospel. A gospel is just a book that records the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ on earth. Okay, today we're studying chapter 1, verses 29 to 34, as Tatiana uh, read earlier. All right, so let's, let's get straight into it. In our passage today, you're going to see a lot of repetition of themes and things that has been talked about in the previous 28 verses, right? We're starting in verse 29, We've already studied verses 1 to 28. You're going to see repetitions of, of things that's talked about. We'll, we'll, we'll get into it um, as we go through. But there's three things that I want to point out to us today from this passage. One, the not-so-obvious grand story. Two, the not-so-obvious mastermind of the story. And three, the not-so-obvious romance in the story. The not-so-obvious grand story, the not-so-obvious mastermind of the story, and the not-so-obvious romance in the story. Let's pray before we dive any deeper. Father, we come to you acknowledging our limitations, both in our minds to truly grasp everything that your word says, um, in our hearts, that even if we do grasp it, our pride um, often suppresses the truths we know are true, um, and also in our actions, that even after we understood it, and even if our hearts want it, oftentimes our actions don't do it. And Lord, I pray that you be gracious to us. And as we study your word, which is the word of the living God, these words that are alive and active, the scripture says, I pray that it penetrates our hearts and our bones and our, so and our, and our, and our marrows and our souls, that we may not only understand it with our minds, but love it with our hearts, and it would drive us to do it as we live on our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, our first point. The not-so-obvious grand story. As we've been studying the book of John, which is in the New Testament, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four Gospels that record the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. John is the last one. As we've been studying the book of John, it seems interesting to me that John, the author, 
there's going to be John the Baptist later, so it's just not to confuse the two. John the author, the one who wrote this book, over and over and over and over again, connects the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ to the Old Testament. Let me, let me repeat a little bit what we've gone through in the past few weeks. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. It points to Genesis chapter 1. Remember, John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. What does Genesis chapter 1, 1 say? In the beginning, God. This word, in, in, in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, this word is the light that enters the darkness and gives life. Echoes Genesis 1. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there's light in the darkness and life in creation. So, so Genesis, John 1, 1 to 5 points to Genesis 1. And then John chapter 1, verse 10 points to Genesis 3. Right? In John chapter 1, verse, verse 10, it says that this light was rejected by the world. This light was not wanted by the world but by the darkness, right? He was rejected by his people. What is that echoing in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve, God's people, rejected God? Adam and Eve rege- didn't want anything to do with them. They wanted to be their own gods, right? And then John, John chapter 1, verse 14, let's move on in John here. The, it connects to redemption, which is also a theme in Genesis chapter 3. Okay, we see if you read uh, in, your, in your iPhones or in, or in your Bibles, John chapter 1, verse 14, it says that this God that created the universe, this God that was rejected by his people, this God became flesh. And we study the person of Jesus Christ. It connects to Genesis chapter, th- uh, chapter 3, verse 15, that after the fall, what did God tell Adam and Eve? That from the woman will come a seed. And the seed will what? The seed will be bruised, but he will crush Satan. God, so, so there's this... There's this echoing of Old Testament, New Testament, of creation, fall, redemption, and Jesus Christ is this, is this seed of the woman that defeats Satan by dying on a cross. On top of that, you see chapter 1, verse 17, connecting to Moses, chapter 1, verse 23, connecting to Isaiah. All these, all these things, all these connections from New Testament to Old Testament. What, what is John, the author, trying to do here? He is, so to speak, trying to paint a picture. It's almost as if he's brushing a canvas Back and forth, back and forth, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament. Old, he, he's painting a picture of what? Of a grand story, of the grand story that is often forgotten by us and gets faded away behind the, bus- the business of life. Let's admit it. Our lives, our daily lives from Monday to Sunday, bring with it daily demands. They're often urgent and immediate These aren't bad things. A lot of them are good things. Our work, which can be so consuming, our time with family, or navigating through relationships, or navigating through conflicts, or changing diapers, dealing with monthly bills, stuck in traffic, keeping up with politics, working through marital issues, et cetera, et cetera. These aren't bad things. These are good things. It's just life. But nonetheless, doesn't our daily grind often cause the grand story that the Bible says is the purpose of all creation to slowly just fade into the backgrounds of our lives and maybe even forgotten. And all of a sudden, life becomes all about the daily routines, the daily grinds, disconnected from the ultimate purpose, which is the grand story. This grand story of the Bible that we keep talking about is of utmost importance because if you claim that the Bible is the word of God, If you claim that this is truly truth, this is the words of the living God, then the grand story of the Bible is also the grand story of the world, of creation, of why anything exists. So what is this grand story? Well, as we mentioned earlier, the story of creation, of fall, and redemption. Remember Genesis, uh, John chapter 1, verse 1 to 5, creation, in the beginning was the word, in the beginning was God, creation. And then Genesis chapter 1, verse 10, there was the fall, God was rejected by his people. In the Genesis 1, chap- chapter 1, verse 14, God became flesh and redeemed his people, and how that connects to Genesis 3, where God, there, there, John the author is trying to paint a picture, he's trying to remind you again, don't forget, don't forget that in the business of daily routines, there, there's a grand story in play, there's something bigger. It's as if he's brushing his paintbrush back and forth, back and forth, saying, this is the purpose of creation. Don't you ever forget it. In our passage today, John the author once again brushes his paintbrush to the Old Testament and connects the new and the old to bring this grand story of redemption even further into the forefronts of the readers in two ways. 
One is by revealing to us the Redeemer, and two is by revealing to us who he is redeeming. Revealing to us the Redeemer and who he is redeeming. First, by revealing to us the Redeemer. Look at verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Okay, so the next day, the plot moves forward here, right? John, John, the John that you just read is John the Baptist. So John the author wrote the book of John. The John here that saw, or you didn't see John yet, but you're going to see the name John in your passage. That's John the Baptist. So John the author is writing about John the Baptist. So the next day, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming towards him. And he says, behold. Behold is a term of emphasis. You're trying to recognize the magnitude of the object that's approaching you. I mean, put yourself in his shoes. Put yourself in that context. This is not just any man. This is the one who created the universe, verses 1 to 5 says. This is the one whose glory Moses was not even able to fully grasp in the Old Testament, John chapter 1, verse 17 says. This is the one who Isaiah said and prophesied, who is to come, verses 23 said. This is the same God that delivered his people out of the slavery of Egypt into the promised land of Canaan, which is a foreshadowing of God delivering us from our sins, the slavery of our sins, into the promised land of the new heaven and the new earth. Behold, the creator of the universe is walking towards you, the king of kings, very God of very God. He's actually taking steps towards you. He's closing in on you. It's not just somebody walking to you. Behold. And for the first time, Jesus comes into the scene. What is he addressed as? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. By the way, how did, how did John the Baptist know for sure that this person coming towards him was, was Jesus? How did John the Baptist know for sure that the person walking towards them was God that became flesh, that, that John chapter 1, verse 14 says? He didn't have a picture of Jesus, and he didn't like, oh, that's him, or he didn't have descriptions of his height or his skin color or his facial features. So how did he know that was Jesus? Well, let's look into our passage, verse 31 and 33. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. He's saying, I myself did not know him. I don't, I don't know what he looks like. I don't know what this God that became flesh looks like. It doesn't mean that he's not, he doesn't know him and that he's not acknowledging him as Lord and Savior. He's just saying, I don't, know, I don't know what he physically looks like. And again, verse 33, I did not know him. But then in verse 32, if you look at your pronouns, it says, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. Verse 33, he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So apparently, the way John the Baptist knew who God in flesh was, the way John the Baptist knew who Jesus was, by whomever the Holy Spirit descended upon. Now, this sounds really weird, but it's not. It's not just out of nowhere. Okay, It's not some weird random thing that's disconnected from the rest of the Bible. It's connected, once again, to the Old Testament. It's a fulfillment of a few prophecies that the Old Testament made in regards to Jesus, okay? So here we see John the author moving his brush once again. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. This is a prophecy. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Jesse's King David's father. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Um, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. This is not just talking about anybody. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Jesse's David's father. The Old Testament says that the Messiah will come from whose descendants? David's descendants. So it's talking about Jesus. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Remember the vine where the branches? John 15, right? It's talking about Jesus. How do you know who, how do you know who this Messiah is? The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. There's other prophecies like this, but this is the main one. So this is he, whom the Spirit of God rested upon. That's how John the Baptist knew who Jesus was. And, and, and it's interesting. He didn't say, when Jesus came to him, I mean, put yourself in his shoes. When Jesus came to him, he didn't say, behold, the King of Kings. Could he have said that? Absolutely. He didn't say, behold, the Lord and creator of all the universe. Could he have said that? Absolutely. But he didn't. 
he chose to say, behold, this, 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 this God that became flesh, that's been expected from all creation is now coming. Behold, the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. This is whom the Spirit of God rested upon. Let me just talk about lamb a little bit because we're going to talk about it more later. Lamb is another brush to the Old Testament. The lamb, uh, we don't know why John the Baptist chose the word lamb. It could be a few reasons. One, he could be referring to the sacrificial lamb in the Old Testament. Before God could appro- before people can approach God in his temple, in his tabernacle in the Old Testament where God resided, um, you had to sacrifice a lamb as a sin offering. Only and only then can you go and enter God because or else you're sinful and, and, and there's no one yet or nothing yet to pay for your sins. So it could be referring to the temple sacrificial lambs uh, that takes away your sin so that you can approach God. It probably more, more likely is talking about the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb is the lamb that was killed when Israel was still in slavery in Egypt. Right? Uh, they, they, they killed lambs and they put the blood of the lambs on the doorposts of their houses. And whoever is marked by the blood of the lamb, the curse of God passes by them. They don't get hit by the curse of God. And this made Pharaoh really scared. And he said, your God is a true God. And he finally released um, um, God's people from slavery to the promised land. So the first, the first, the, the, the temple lamb makes it clear that you can approach God, not because of how good you are. You don't approach God because of your list of righteous deeds. You approach God. The only way you can do that is by the sacrifice of another. The Passover lamb does the same thing. You're not freed from slavery because how good you are. You're not freed from slavery because how strong you are. You're freed from slavery because of the sacrifice of another. Jesus Christ comes. What does John the Baptist say? Behold, the true lamb, the lamb of God. He is God who took on flesh to pay for the sins of his people so that we can be sinless in him. We can be delivered out of the slavery of our own sin into the true promised land by becoming the true sacrificial lamb, dying on a cross, making it clear that our redemption is not based on our strength, is not based on anything we do, but based on the sacrifice of another. The Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God. But the words in verse 29 isn't only focusing on the Redeemer, it's focusing on also who he's redeeming, which is our second sub-point. Okay, very briefly, it's interesting that it seems like John the author is talking about two different groups of people here. Verse 29 says, the purpose of the land is to take away the sins of who? The world. Take away the sins of the world. That's what what your passage says, right? But then you look at verse 31. It says the purpose is that he may be revealed to the world? No, to Israel. So first he says the purpose of the Lamb of Jesus is to take away the sins of the world. But verse 31 says that he's to reveal to Israel. So which one is it? Is it the world or is it Israel? Is it Jewish Israelites, the nation of Israel? Here yet again, you find another brushstroke to the Old Testament. Back in the Old Testament, God's people were literally the biological people of Israel, Jews, the Israelites. They were God's people. Other people could be, could be engrafted into it, but mainly the focus is Israel. But ultimately, God is not just the God of a nation of Israel. Israel is meant to point to something greater. Just as the lambs in the Old Testament isn't ultimately about them, but it's ultimately about the Lamb of God, that takes away sins, the Old Testament people of God, Israel, isn't really just about Israel. It's ultimately pointing to who? Verse 29, whoever in the world would receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Who is true Israel? Who is truly God's people? Just the biological descendants of Abraham? Just Israelites, Jewish people? No. He's saying the lambs aren't about, don't focus on the sacrificial lambs. (laughs) The lambs point you to the true lamb. Don't focus on the biological people of God in the Old Testament. They're pointing to the true people of God, whoever whoever would receive Christ as Lord and Savior in the world. Okay. Jesus again, I mean, John, John the author again, pointing us back, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, saying this is Jesus. He's the Redeemer. He's the one to come, God who came in flesh, to offer himself and wash away our sins. He is the true sacrificial lamb. And now anyone who would receive him, no matter what nationality you are, no matter what your skin color is, no matter what your financial background is, you can be his people. You can be the people of God. This is it. 
This really is it. This is the purpose of all of existence. <laughs> For us to realize we have a creator. It didn't just happen by chance. We, we have a creator who created all the earth and deserves all authority because he is the creator. But yet we rebelled against him. Creation, fall. We rebelled against him in our own sin. We wanted to be our own gods. But yet this same creator God, whom has been rejected by us, came in the flesh as the true sacrificial lamb that's been pointed to for years in the Old Testament, willingly paid the price and took the consequences of our sins that we deserve on that horrific cross. That's, that's, a, that's the purpose of all this. If, if you claim the Bible is the word of God. If you don't, then that's a different story. But if you claim the Bible is the word of God, that is why any of this is here. And now, as his true people, redeemed by his blood, we have a job to do. If you've truly, if we've truly received Christ and Lord and Savior, we have a job to do. What is that? It's to bring this not so obvious grand story, often unseen, often suppressed behind the busyness of the world, back to the forefront of people's minds. By every decision we make, should be for this reason. How we speak, how we date, how we forgive, how we treat our spouses, how we pursue our careers, what we buy, how much we save, how we parent our children, how we act in traffic, decisions made in private. Everything in our lives should be to paint this picture of the not so obvious grand story that has been put to the background of the world. Remember, there's something greater to live for. There's someone bigger to live for. And when others see our lives, the decisions we make, the words we say, the way we carry ourselves, our character, our integrity, do you think they would say, man, there seems to be something bigger this person is living for? Would people say when they look at your lives, there seems to be someone greater this person is living for? I see it. I see it in how they work, in how they relate to others, in their marriages, in their parenting, in how they spend their money, in how they treat their Uber drivers. In everything they do, there's something bigger. You're painting this not-so-obvious grand story back into the forefronts of our minds. What a convicting question it is to ask myself if, if this is the type of life I'm living. All right, let's move on to the next point. The not-so-obvious grand story, second point, the not-so-obvious mastermind behind this story. We just said, as we make this grand story more visible to the world by our lives, it will point to who? the Lamb of God, right? The Redeemer, the Creator, the God that became flesh. This is the obvious and natural connection, which has also been the focus on the book of John so far. Jesus, or the second person of the Trinity, not the Father, the, not the first person of the Trinity, not the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the focus has been on the second person of the Trinity, right? The God who became flesh, John 1, 14. The one rejected by his people, John 1, 10, that's Jesus. The one prophesied by Isaiah to come, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, verse 34, that you read in your passages today. The focus has been on Jesus. But for the first time, throughout the whole book of John, for the first time, you see a fuller picture of who is actually running the show here. Who is the true mastermind of this grand story? It's not just Jesus. It's not just the second person of the Trinity. It's the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is a true mastermind. How, how do we see that? Look at verse 33 with me. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I've seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. Do you see a Trinitarian focus here? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. God the Father who sends God the Spirit to affirm Jesus' identity, who God the Son is. God the Spirit coming down from heaven, affirming who Jesus Christ is by resting upon him. God the Son, Jesus Christ, revealing God the Father to the world through whom? By doing what? By sending who? The Holy Spirit. You see? For the first time, there's a Trinitarian focus. God the Father sends them. God the Son accomplishes the salvation work and sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reveals who the Son is and, and, and applies the salvation work as being sent out by the Son. It, it's a Trinitarian focus. Okay. Before we move forward, let me just address one culturally sensitive issue here. 
baptism of the Holy Spirit. It says Jesus sends and baptizes people with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? Many have misunderstood what it means, and for some reason, it's often associated with some sort of euphoric sense experience that results in some kind of uncontrollable body movement and expressions. That's not what being baptized by the Holy Spirit <laughs> means. Okay, some will say that you, you'll fall into some kind of uncontrollable laughter, and if you haven't fallen into this kind of laughter, then you haven't been baptized by the Holy Spirit. This is the sign of salvation, and this is a sign of a mature Christian. If this happens to you, you're like, you're either not saved, or you know, if you if you you're not like that mature of a Christian, or speak in tongues. Um, if you if you if you can't speak in tongues and you haven't been baptized by the Holy Spirit, or um, you're not a mature Christian, or some will say that you kind of get this like epilepsy, and you kind of like fall down or stuff like that, right? That that's being baptized by the Holy Spirit, some kind of euphoric, uncontrollable body bodily movement, and that's either the sign of salvation or the sign of Christian maturity. Okay, that's not what baptism by the Holy Spirit means. Um, so what does it what does it mean? Let's let's let the Bible tell us what being baptized with the Holy Spirit means. Okay, let's refer back to our passage, verse 32. What is the Holy Spirit's role? What does the Holy Spirit do? God, the Spirit. Verse 32, the Holy Spirit reveals to you who the Son is. This is the Son of God. This is who the Savior is, right? Reveals to you the Spirit, just like it revealed to John the Baptist who Jesus was. Verse 33, the Holy Spirit not only reveals who the Son is, but is sent out by the Son to baptize people with. And how do you know that someone's been baptized by the Holy Spirit? Let's let Scripture define it again. Another brush, the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 23, and 26 and 27. Okay, this is what it says. I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, and I will give you a new heart. We read this in our call to worship. A new spirit I'll put within you, and I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Okay, in this passage, in Ezekiel, okay, I don't know if it's on, on there or not, but on Ezekiel chapter 36, it says, the Lord declares, I will send the spirit. Who sends the spirit? The Lord. In the New Testament, in John, who sends the spirit? Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus Christ is very God of very God. Jesus Christ is the Lord, the God of the Old Testament. Okay, when the Holy Spirit is sent by the Lord, is sent by Jesus um, uh, to someone's heart, what, what is the evidence of it? I think it's in your call to worship. If it's not on the screen, you can look at it, the call to worship. What, what does Ezekiel say is the evidence of being baptized with the Holy Spirit? Is it uncontrollable after? Is it speaking in tongues? Is it epilepsy? No. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27. What's the result? I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This, you know that the Spirit is in you. You know that you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit if you have a passion and desire to walk in His statutes and carefully obey His rules. In other words, it produces in people a desire for obedience to the Lord. That's what being baptized by the Holy Spirit means. In other words, it produces the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 6. Now, that's what the fruit of the Spirit is. You, you, have, you have true love, you have true compassion, you have true humility, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. And done so not to earn our own salvation, but because we know there was a lamb that was slain for us in our sins. And the fruit of the Spirit leads us to obedience, which matches Ezekiel 30. That's what being baptized by the Spirit means, not, not epilepsy, not speaking in tongues, not uncontrollable laughter. Okay, so when, when Jesus Christ baptizes with the Holy Spirit, he re, the Holy Spirit reveals to people who he is and what he has done for us as a sacrificial lamb. This then changes our hearts, Ezekiel says, and causes us to obey him, which is a sign of salvation. You will know them by their fruit. Okay, so God the Father, who planned our salvation, sends the Son and the Holy Spirit. God the Son, who accomplishes our salvation on the cross, is revealed by the Holy Spirit and sends the Holy Spirit to do what? God the Spirit, to reveal the Son and to enter into our hearts and apply the salvation work and make it real in our hearts. This is true baptism, by the way, not baptism with water. Baptism with water does not save you. If you're baptized with water, it does not save you. It just points to Christ. 
I don't have it in my notes, but I'm just going to say it. It's interesting that in the other four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when, when the authors address John the Baptist, they always say John the Baptist, John the Baptist, John the Baptist. But when you read our book, the book of John, he's not addressed as John the Baptist. He's addressed as, just as John. Why is that? Why, did he, why is he the only one that intentionally didn't address the Baptist to John? Not because it's wrong to address John as John the Baptist. That's, that's right to do so. But John the author is trying to make a point. There's only one true baptizer. <laughs> There's only one true, real, actual baptism. Not done by John, but by Jesus Christ, by sending you the Spirit. Water is, is a sign that points to that. Okay. See, it's not just about Jesus. It's about, it's about God the Son. It's about God the Father, but God the Spirit. Jesus, in our passage, um, um, brings to the forefront uh, John the author in our passage brings to the forefront of our minds this grand narrative, but also the triune God, who is the actual authority and mastermind behind this grand narrative. I'll just repeat it one more time, because this is really important systematic theology for us to know. The Father foreordained and planned our salvation, sends the Son, sends the Holy Spirit. The Son accomplishes our salvation on the cross. The Holy Spirit applies that salvation into our hearts. So what? Why does that matter in our lives? It's important because you know what this tells us? It's significant. It tells us that in our salvation, we are 100% absolutely passive. We have done nothing. God the Father planned it. God the Son accomplished it. God the Holy Spirit revealed it. The only reason why this redemptive story is in motion is not because we're smart enough, because God the Father foreordained and planned it. The only reason why we're able to be included into this grand redemptive story is not because we're good or moral enough, but because God the Son died in our place, taking our sins upon himself. And the only reason why we're able to accept this salvation work isn't because we're humble enough, but because God the Holy Spirit was sent into our hearts and reveal this salvation work upon us. We are absolutely passive. It is nothing we did. It is all in all the work of our triune God. Actually, we did contribute something to our salvation, sin. <laughs> There's one thing we contribute to our salvation, that's our sin. Everything else was the work of our triune God. See, this, this changes drastically the application that we saw in point one. We said in point one, our lives are meant to be a picture of, of painting this grand narrative that often is so not obvious and forgotten by the world. And how do we do that? We do that by living moral lives, living in integrity, obedience to God. And, 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 and when we do that, we're bringing the forefront of, of this redemptive story to people's minds. But living a moral life in itself, being, just being obedient in itself, it won't point, it, it won't point others to the grand narrative. Just general moral living, just doing religious duties and disciplines and, and spiritual commitments, that won't point people to the, to the true grand story or to the triune God. Any religion can teach that. Any good philosophy can teach that. Be good people. Who, who wouldn't say that? <laughs> the point isn't just being good people. <clears throat> we miss this. Every week, I feel like we, we hear this, but we leave... We leave Sunday morning, and, and we think the application is do better. <laughs> that's a part of it, yes, but that's nowhere near the full picture. Any religion can teach you do better. Any world philosophy can teach you do better. What is different about Christianity is saying that not only am I called to live a holy life and a moral life and a spiritually disciplined life and an obedient life to God, but my good works are meant to be done in such a way that makes it clear I am still saved by grace alone. My work, my good deeds does not save me. So how do we do that applicably? How do we do lives as obedient children of God without making people think that our obedience is what saves us? It's by making sure that as Christians, we're not only passionate in our obedience, but also compared to anyone else in the world, we must be the quickest to say, I'm sorry. We're not only called to live moral, righteous lives, because yes, we're to point people to something greater, someone bigger we're living for, but because you're not saved by how good you are, guess what that should make us do? It should make us say I'm sorry very often. 
because we're admitting to the world it's not me. I didn't do this. I'm completely passive. I need a savior. I'm not the savior. I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not, I don't have it all together. I do mess up. I'm, I'm vulnerable. I fall short. Be honest about our sins because you're not the savior. If all we do is religious, moral, spiritual disciplines, you're not truly painting a picture of salvation history. You're, you're painting a picture of your own strength and your own ability to be obedient and be disciplined. That's all you're doing. Thus, you're glorifying yourselves rather than the Trinitarian God who has done all the work for our salvation. In order to bring the grand story of redemption to the forefront and to glorify the triune God who's done all the work, the planner, the accomplisher, the applier of his salvation work, then Christians, might on, Christians must not only be passionate in our obedience, but also compared to anyone else, we must be the quickest to be vulnerable, to admit we're not perfect, to testify that we are in desperate need of a savior by being the quickest to say, I'm sorry. A quick story, um, the responsibilities of uh, elders of a church is to um, um, make sure that whoever they're admitting into their church membership are true Christian believers who truly have received Christ as Lord and Savior. Because as you know, many people are Christians because their parents are Christians, their families are Christian, their friends are Christians, so they think they're Christians. But there's no true personal relationship with Christ as Lord and Savior. The elder's job is to make sure that they're, they're actually truly Christians and they have received Christ as Lord and Savior. So when I became a member of my church in Orlando, Florida, um, the elders told me that they're going to they're gonna ask me one question. I'm going to ask you one question. And I know enough. I was in seminary, so I know enough that the question is going to be something about them making sure that I'm a Christian. So I thought the question was like, you know, how many times you go to church in a year? You know, or, or how many times you read the Bible? Or how many times you pray in a week or share your faith? Right? Those are the spiritual disciplines. The Christians would do those things. Those things. That's true. But that's not, that's not what they asked. They're more interested in seeing whether I had a heart that was open to admitting my sins. So this is what they asked me. I want you to name three people in the past few months that you've apologized to that's not a member of your family. <laughs> that's how they vetted how they know who, who, who true believers are. Not just by their righteous deeds. Name me three people in the past few months that you've apologized to who is not a member of your family. And I was like, oh, darn it. Because <laughs> this is a sign of a new heart. This is a sign of a, of a, of a heart of flesh. You're, you're quick to admitting you don't have it all together. Now, it doesn't mean that if you can't name three people in the past few months that you haven't said sorry to, that's not a part of your family. It doesn't mean that you're not a Christian, but you, you get the point. They're trying to say this is the general attitude of somebody Who's, who's, who's a believer in Christ, you're not prideful, you're not self-defensive about your mistakes, you're not unwilling to say, I'm sorry, because you're not the Savior. Get over yourself. <laughs> you were saved. You were in need of saving. This is the kind of life that truly brings the grand narrative of redemption into the forefront of our minds. One that desires to live holy lives, but yet is very quick to confess when they fail. Because when we do that, we're testifying to the triune God and his work for us. By the way, it could be a healthy exercise to ask ourselves, when was the last time I said to somebody, I'm sorry, in the past few months, who isn't a part of our family members? It's a good question, right? And, and how, how long has it been? A month? A year? And if it's been a year, why has it been that long? I know it's not because you've not made mistakes. That's for sure. So then what's the reason? Has our hearts truly been shaped in the likeness of Christ, who humbled himself, died on the cross for our sins, Let's tell the world, let's not just point the world to how disciplined we are. Let's point the world to our triune God, the one who deserves our glory. All right, last point. The not so obvious grand story, the not so obvious um, um, uh, mastermind of the story. Third point, the not so obvious romance in the story. By revealing the grand narrative, by revealing the mastermind behind the grand narrative, which is not just the son, but the triune God, it reveals something else, a not so obvious romance. We've seen throughout the book of John for the past few weeks that the Son loves you. The Son, Jesus Christ, really, really loves you, and that's true. But what about the Father? It seems like the focus has been on the Son sacrificing, the Son reconciling, the Son giving up, and then the Holy Spirit entering our lives, the Holy Spirit revealing to us and applying the salvation work on us. But, but what about God the Father? He seems like this sort of distant judge somewhere sitting in heaven on his throne all angry and upset 
And the son's saying, no, 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 father, don't, don't punish them. I'll die for them. And the father's like, oh, okay, then, if you're going to die for them. I'll... That, that's the image, right? The father's this distant person up there, and God the son is the one that loves us, but God the father doesn't really love us. But we see now that this isn't the case. Here's another Old Testament connection. Our author moves his brush once again. I want, I want to direct us um, from our passage to another one. Look, look, at, look at verse 29 in our passage again. When Christ was first introduced in our passage in verse 29, it says what? The Lamb of God. But at the end of our passage, verse 34, Jesus isn't introduced as the Lamb of God, but introduced as what? The Son of God. Lamb of God, Son of God. Now to the Jewish readers, who at the time mostly were Jewish readers, this would have echoed in their ears another story, another very popular story in the Old Testament. Can you think of it? Of a father and a son and a lamb? It's in Genesis 22, the story of Abraham and Isaac. The story of Abraham is that Abraham was promised by God to have a child, um, and he's waited this child for, for years and years, and, 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 and finally Isaac is here. Finally, after years and years of waiting, Sarah, Abraham's wife, uh, born a child, um, and in Genesis, uh, Genesis 17, finally God's promise that, that, was, that was promised by God to Abraham in Genesis 17 was fulfilled in Genesis 21. And now, in Genesis 22, what happens? This is what God told Abraham to do. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. God told Abraham to sacrifice this, this son he's been waiting for, he loves. Now, of course, God already knew his plan that he was going to stop him from doing that, which he did at the end of the day. God stopped Abraham from doing that. But, but notice the words that God chose to say to Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, why, why all the dramatics? Why not just say, take Isaac and sacrifice him? Why, why all the, your son, your only son, whom you love? He's wanting to make a point. This is your only son. This is the son whom you love, the one you've been waiting for for years. Look at the tension here. This isn't an easy request. This command is much harder for Abraham to follow compared to if God were just to tell him to kill himself. Your son whom you love, your only son, now, the point of Genesis 22 isn't saying that God's going to talk to you and tell you to do crazy things. That's not what it's talking about, okay? There's a lot of other Bible passages that kills that altogether. But you must interpret the story in light of, again, salvation history, the grand narrative, the grand story. Why would God initiate such an event with Abraham and Isaac? To make a point, isn't it hard? Isn't it excruciatingly hard as a father to have to sacrifice your only son. Wouldn't you much rather die yourself than to offer up your child? Fathers, wouldn't you in a split second offer your life for your child's life without even thinking? It's not even a question. Wouldn't you do so? I, I know you would. The story continues. God finally stopped Abraham from killing Isaac. And what happened then? Chapter 22, verse 13 to 14. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram. A ram is a male lamb, caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord shall be provided. God replaced Abraham's son, Isaac, with a male lamb, with a sacrificial lamb. Thank goodness God stopped Abraham, right? You can almost hear the sigh of relief from Abraham's face when, he, when God said, stop, stop. That's, that's the tension here. Yet we go back to our passage today. We look at verse 29, and then we read verse 24. Jesus described as, in verse 29, the Lamb of God, and in verse 34, as the Son of God, saying what? God the Father doesn't get a lamb to replace Jesus with. There is no ram offered up instead of his son. For the Son of God was also the Lamb of God. 
God the Father did not merely almost offer up his son, his only son, the son whom he loves. He did not stop the knife midway like Abraham did. But on the cross, Jesus became the recipient of the full wrath of God. Your son. Your only son, the son whom you love. Now the son, Jesus, didn't drag his feet to the cross saying, okay, I guess I'll die for them if you want me to. No. In John 10, it's clear that Jesus himself said that I lay down my life in my own accord. It's my own will. Nobody, I love you. I, I, he loves you and he died for you. But, but don't let this make you miss the not so obvious romance in the story. It's not just the son. The father loves you. Imagine the pain and suffering that the father had to go through for your salvation as well. He offered up his son, his only begotten son, the son whom he loves. Why? Why did he do all that? Because he loves you. <laughs> because he wants to be with you. He wants to have you for eternity. You know what this means for you, Christian? This means that Jesus did not die for you in order to make the Father love you. This means Jesus died for you because the Father loves you. That is the not-so-obvious romance in this story. It's the work of the triune God. The triune God who created the world, us men rejected and rebelled against him, but the same triune God pursued us and paid our sins himself. Not just the Son, but three in one. The Father planned it, sends his only begotten beloved Son. The Son accomplished it on the cross, sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reveals and applies the salvation work into our hearts. He has planned it all. Romans 9 said, before you've even done anything good or bad, for you that will receive him. Why does he love you that much? Why did the Father plan your salvation? Why did Jesus die for you? Why did they choose to send the Holy Spirit into your hearts? Is it because we deserve it? No, absolutely not. Is it because of our unrighteousness? No, the Bible is clear about that. Then why? Why does this triune God love me so much? Why does he give me mercy and grace? I don't know. I really don't know. But you best ask that question to yourself every single day of your life. <clears throat> and you let that question guide every decision you make. And you live a life passionately in obedience to him and very quickly in admitting your flaws. Thus bringing this grand story of salvation into the forefront of our minds and bringing the glory to the mastermind behind it all our triune God. This is what life is about. If we miss this, I don't care how successful you think you are in life, if we miss this, we've missed it all. This is the purpose of life. This is what everything points to. I pray that this would be our life's passion, that we be most passionate about living our holy lives and obedience to him, to our God, thus pointing others to this grand story, the purpose of creation, but also be the first to say, I'm sorry. I don't have it all together. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Thus pointing others not only to the grand story, but to the mastermind of the story, the only triune God, and the mercies available to those who would receive him upon his cross. Let's pray. Father, how amazing is your word. How lovely is your scripture, is your inspired word that you would reveal your love to us in such a way that, that tells us we have done nothing to earn it, but it's all done by you. And Lord, guide our hearts, help our hearts believe this more and more, help our hearts fall in deeper love with you, and let us ask that question every day. Why did you want me to be yours? Why did you die for me? Why did you plan for me? Why did you reveal him to me? We don't know. There's nothing we've done. <clears throat> just like there's nothing that Israel did. They're, they're a nation weak, you said in the Old Testament. It is not because they're strength. And Father, I beg you that as we ask this question every day, we would, we would have our eyes fixed upon the man of sorrows, upon Jesus Christ on that cross, and by doing so, be guided into this triune God who has loved us eternally, and live our lives for something greater, live our lives for someone bigger, that the world will know and see from our lives this beautiful painting 
of a not-so-obvious grand story and of a not-so-obvious mastermind and of this love that you have given us, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.